We just finished a briefing and coordinating efforts amongst all of the uh, departments in City Hall, and we wanted to give a more comprehensive update to actions that the city's taking. Um, so I'll start with giving an overview from the city side. I'll uh, invite Superintendent Walker to give uh, some additional information from the school side, and then we'll open it up to questions. We do have our health officer here, our director of health and human services, our director of public safety, and we could talk through all different dynamics. We are looking to be more aggressive than most municipalities in the state of New Jersey, even though that we recognize that we have no confirmed cases today. Um, we don't view that as the gauge of whether we should be taking uh, aggressive action or not. So we're taking several steps uh, as of last night and uh, into the next week. Uh, we set up a call-in number. The reason we did that was the process for people to get checked and to communicate that they think that they might have been infected with the virus or around somebody with it was creating some confusion. We had somebody come to City Hall yesterday saying that his father is tested positive, which he happened to be, and that he was contaminated and uh, or infected. And so um, we wanted to create a policy around that. Today, the policy is that we urge you to call our uh, hotline, which we've provided, or uh, we would ask you to call your medical professional. professional. They then take initial tests. Uh, subsequent to that, while the individual is quarantined during that time period, uh, if need be, they take the COVID-19 test. And from that period of time, we're seeing about 72 hours plus from CDC to come back to the municipality in telling us whether it's a confirmed case or not. Uh, there's a lot of rumors in Jersey City around potential confirmed cases. And I just want to reiterate that today that we don't have any confirmed cases. Um, the second thing is, um, We've made the decision to change how the city conducts its business. Um, we are going to appointment only on every department in the city. So that includes HEDC, that includes the building department, that includes health and human services, that includes the resident response center. And if we're asking uh, residents and community groups and nonprofits to be conscious of big groups and gatherings, we want to lead by example. And so we're going to put out information on the city's website, how we're moving on that front as well. We are suspending um, non-vitals for um, safety issues. So, uh, for example, parking issues that people come to the desk to get parking permits or to renew parking permits. We're going to be waiving that process for a period of time um, in order to not encourage people to come to City Hall where there isn't an appointment mechanism to put in place and we won't be enforcing that in the foreseeable future. Um, we are taking the approach, as I said earlier, of canceling all of city-sponsored or city-involved events. And that means that if there's a direct city-sponsored event that we're organizing or if it's something that has a permit that somebody has come to us on, and we're doing that, again, to lead by example and to show that we're asking others to take precautions and we are going to take those same precautions for the next week. And then from there, when there's more information, we'll take it from there. Part of the difficulty for the city is that there is a lack of information and every day the circumstances change. How people get tested, when they get tested, how long the time period is, what the process is. So we want to err on the side of caution. We are in uncharted territory, so we think canceling all of our events and, and demonstrating that to the public is very important. We're also going to be asking private groups that are non-city involved to be tracking attendance best that they can. We're going to be providing information that we would like them to gather. It is the Health and Human Services Department's responsibility to uh, track people that have tested positive and where they've been involved. So knowing that this may be wider spread in places like Jersey City, we want to make sure that we have documentation to make that job as easy as possible. So we're going to be reaching out to the Liberty House, the West Inn, banquet halls, uh, places where large people gather to make sure that they are aware of the protocols that we want them to take in place uh, to make sure that we're protected. And then finally, we're going to be putting in restrictions on time for larger nightclubs over the weekend and into next week. Um, and the logic of this is pretty straightforward. You know, you have a lot of conversations today about controlled environments and curtailing people's social gathering. In a controlled environment, I talk about schools, I talk about places of employment where people are asking them to work from home. And uh, logically, one would discuss then uncontrolled environments like a nightclub where you have a thousand people coming at night. And so if we could minimize interaction in that sort of environment where it's difficult to track people, we think it's prudent to take those steps now. So we're gonna be proactive on that. And uh, with that, I want to turn it over to the superintendent of schools to give you a little perspective on what they're doing to prepare and uh, how they're dealing with the 30,000 children that go to the Jersey City Public School System. In the Jersey City Public School District, we have about 30,000 students. We have 40 school sites, but with the child care centers, we have another 40. So we have about 80 sites. 
the biggest thing for us is really to try to control the level of information in, in terms of making sure parents are aware of what's actually happening. In doing that, we have the Blackboard Connect where we're able to submit information to parents on a regular basis. And that's really been um, you know, one of the things that's helped us to mitigate the number of rumors that have been out there based upon cases that have been identified. And certainly, as you heard the mayor say earlier, there have been no cases that have been confirmed in Jersey City. Our schools have been involved with an intensified disinfectant structure in terms of making sure that the schools are clean on a regular basis in the mornings and in the afternoons and during the course of the day when necessary. We've developed a new protocol in terms of accepting visitors. As a matter of fact, at this point in time, there are no visitors that are allowed to enter the school. Of course, unless there's an emergency or there's a previous appointment, and in doing so, we provided a list of questions that are generally asked uh, when visitors come into the building. In addition to that, we also make sure that before they come in, that um, there's um, those folks that are involved are able to answer any questions uh, prior to coming into the building. We're working with the Department of Health and the Department of Education in terms of providing the guidance and support in reference to the potential of a health school-related closure. We're providing um, extensive and expanded um, home instruction support for students so that in the event that we have to close, we still can comply with the district regulation of making sure that students receive the appropriate instruction based upon a written plan of instruction that includes computer-based programs as well as paper-based programs. Uh, our position is that we have approximately 25,000 computers that are available. Uh, we have a Google Classroom site as well as Khan Academy uh, software-based program that can be exercised. And in some cases, we know that there may be some students that may not have access to the internet or Wi-Fi service. In doing that, we provided these uh, paper packets for all the students to take home. As a matter of fact, on yesterday, we had teachers uh, during a half-day session take time to prepare those packets in making sure uh, that every child from pre-K to 12 would be in a position to have an instructional packet available for them in the event that we had a school closure. Uh, our staff has been vigilant in making sure that they monitor uh, the classroom structure, the students, uh, anyone that may be wanting to enter the buildings. And um, as a result of that, uh, our communication process has been uh, increased to support the development of the process. As we may mention to them and even the nurses early on, each and every day things change. Our position is to identify the best information to make the best decision. We work in collaboration certainly with the city. Uh, they've been very cooperative in terms of supporting us. Our transportation services, we spend time uh, disinfecting the buses in the morning and certainly in the afternoon at central office. We have a procedure in place where anyone that needs to come to the building, they have to go through a screening process. We've updated and advanced uh, our information base in terms of uh, registration of students. We have situations where students are registered even at this point in time and coming to school. And often, uh, in some cases, there are students that are coming from outside the country. And in some cases, they're also coming from some of what we call the hot zones. And doing that, once we identify that, uh, we're putting into place the regulation of the 14-day quarantine period for some of our students uh, under those circumstances. But we're taking every precaution possible to make sure that we ensure the safety of not just our students, but anyone that's in the immediate area of the school system. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'll open up to any questions. I think we have the resources here to answer any specific questions regarding the city's policies um, or procedures. I want to say thank you to the Jersey Medical Center for participating this morning um, and some of the other institutions, the library system as well, making sure that we're covering all bases. At this point, all schools are operating normally. Yeah. Yes, they are. No changes. no changes at this point in time. And could you clarify, and, Superintendent, could you please clarify, you said that some students are already in quarantine because they came from a hot zone? No, I'm sorry. Uh, there are no students in quarantine because they came from a hot zone, but what I'm saying is that we're putting in procedures that if we have students that are coming in to register and they're coming from what we call some of the hot zone areas, then our position is to comply with the regulations from the Department of Health 
that would uh, allow us to recommend that they be placed in a 14-day quarantine period. Under which circumstances will you close the school? Well, right now we're waiting for direction from the Department of Health and the Department of Education. Uh, we're waiting for guidance from them. I think that, and uh, you know, I don't want to assume, but much of what's going on is to kind of reduce the increase of any cases that may develop uh, or people contacting the coronavirus. And so the large gatherings certainly has become a concern. I think that if, if for some reason in Jersey City or New Jersey, and if there are areas where there are increases in terms of number of cases, then that could be a cause for the district to say that we need to close schools uh, to mitigate the circumstance of the increase of, of the, uh, the virus. Was sporting events, extracurricular activities? Excuse me? Was sporting events, extracurricular activities? Yeah, actually, the majority of the, the fortunate part about it at this point in time is that the winter athletic season has come to an end for the most part, and only those teams that have advanced, and especially in basketball, are continuing. So for the most part, um, sports and extracurricular activities for most of the schools have concluded. But those that... Not totally, no, not totally. You're not doing anything. Well, we are. As a matter of fact, we are doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, which we're identifying where students are going, the number of students that could possibly be in that area during that period of time, we're making decisions uh, based upon that. Will you play the games without an audience, like the NBA? Yeah. Well, actually, with our middle school program, that's one of the things we're doing at this point in time. Uh, we're playing those middle school basketball games without spectators. That's correct. When it comes to feeding some of these kids, if, for instance, the schools are closed, sometimes yes. it's the only way that they get a hot meal. How is the city or district going to go about helping well, the Department of Agriculture has provided a waiver to the schools, and one of the things that we do in one of our plans is that we would set up satellite food areas, and we'd allow the students to go to those particular areas and get what we call a grab-and-go. So this way we can reduce the number of crowds that would be gathering in any one area. Yeah, well, we're going to put a curfew essentially in place in the larger nightclubs, to be perfectly clear. So. Um, we're trying to find the balance between what a small restaurant is versus, let's say, a larger nightclub on Newark Avenue, as an example, that attracts people from New York and all over the state of New Jersey. Um, I would classify that as a kind of an uncontrolled environment. We don't know who's coming in and coming out. And we want to err on the side of caution. We're in uncharted territory, so we're going to be more aggressive than most. As the superintendent said, we are uh, certainly prepared, and we want to be proactive. We, we think we're early, but as we were saying in the, in the meeting earlier, it's better to be early than be late in this sort of situation. Yeah. We're working through the executive order and the time right now. So whether we're working at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., but we're basically before the crowds get there. So we're allow restaurants to operate. Um, and then the larger nightclubs where you have thousands of people come to, the larger venues, um, we're going to put restrictions on those. That would take effect for this week? Yeah, we're going to put restrictions immediately. So how many people in Jersey City have been actually tested? Okay, so, so, so. Um, there always is a lot of misinformation around that, and one of the challenges that we have from the health department, and I'm going to refer to our director on that, is that there's constant rumors, and um, we're constantly battling that sort of, of unfortunate circumstances here. So when somebody gets initial screening or testing, and they're waiting whether to move forward into the next part of the COVID-19 screening process, that's when the rumors promulgate throughout the city, and it's been very frustrating for us. Um, I'll refer to uh, the director of uh, Health and Human Services, what she wants to expand on. And, and, and we had a conversation earlier, I don't want to have to put them on the spot here, but uh, the, with the Jersey City Medical Center, and uh, they were very much part of our conversation. The chief medical officer is here, and um, they are certainly prepared. They run drills constantly on this sort of situation. They are ready in the case that there is need for um, um, more um, care there. So they iterated that and we're thankful for them. But I'll turn over to Stacey. Yeah. So um, I, I want to make it very clear that like the process of testing, because not everybody that thinks that they've become, um, you know, in contact with someone that knows someone uh, is being tested for COVID-19. There's a series of other tests that people go through. So at this time, um, under the CDC protocol, there are four people that have been tested um, and we're waiting for one more result, uh, but th three of the four are absolutely negative and the one we're waiting for the CDC. Um, we have 
great confidence that uh, we've been going through the proper protocols. We've been monitoring people that have come off planes that are asymptomatic. They've been self-monitoring. A lot of people are um, self-quarantining themselves, uh, and we think that's very helpful if they believe that they've been in contact with someone with the virus. But at, at, at this point in time, um, we've been monitoring many individuals that are asymptomatic and anyone that has passed through the tiers of testing, um, there's been four tests issued of people under investigation. Uh, so individuals that are coming off planes in hot spots are given a test kit um, or like a little bit of information to contact their local health department and or if they call one of our, our numbers, the 1-800-222-1222 or 201-547-5208, and, and those two numbers, we, there's a series of questions that are asked about your experience. So like, have you traveled? Have you been, do you have these three symptoms? If so, then we will work with you and if all of it, so they self-monitor uh, with fever checks and they call that into the health department or we call them if we haven't heard from them. So. We only manage Jersey City residents, but anyone that's working in Jersey City, we are informed immediately by the states th that have employees that work here. And we have not to date been informed of anyone that, um, that has a cause for any concern here. What about this visit to City Hall? So are you being alerted when someone from Jersey City, like a Jersey City resident, is getting a plane coming from a hot zone? Is there some alert you're getting? We get the manifest. You want to get What about this visit to City Hall? Hold on, let me this. This is Dr. Pizzola, uh, our uh, chief uh, health yeah. officer. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I think that's a great question. Uh, what we are doing is we're doing two things. If there is a suspect case, as director said, we have, we, ha we have at this point uh, four that we tested, three came out negative, okay? And one uh, result is still awaited. So for the other three, there is nothing needs to be done, okay? So that is over. For the one that is remaining, once we get, unfortunately, a positive case, so we have a protocol in place to, to investigate the close contacts, okay? And then go from there and advise them the quarantine for 14 days. That's number one. Let me let me finish my <laughs> number one. Second is what Stacy was talking about. The question that came about the healthy exposed individuals. We do get the list of those people through our state health department. State health department gets it through different sources, like from the airport. People coming from different hard zones and they are screened at the airport and then through cruise ship also sometimes, okay? So they come from there and they are listed and the list is provided to the state health department and we get it. And then we therefore monitor them in a different criteria basis. You know, we assess them. We want to know whether they are a high risk, they are a moderate risk, they are a low risk or they are a no risk. So we do monitor them and we advise them either self-observation, self-quarantine, self-isolation or active monitoring. You know, if the person is really uh, having have contact with a confirmed case, we want to make sure that we monitor them for 14 days. So that is how it goes for now. Okay, so when someone is flying from one of these hot zones, for instance, are you getting information in Jersey City that someone from Jersey City is coming from a hot zone and is in the air right now? And when that person lands, no, no, uh, yes, no, not, not really immediately. There is a process. What happens is that uh, I, I should let you know there is a um, migration and quarantine station at the airports. Okay, right. with uh, I, I don't exactly know now the numbers, you know, but it probably is somewhere around ten. You know, we have in the in the country in the whole country. So what they do is uh, the migration and quarantine station. They monitor those cases if they are coming from those flights, and they do monitor. And they do, if they do find those symptoms that we just spoke about, you know, like a fever, cough, difficulty in breathing. If they find that, then the list is created and the list is forwarded to the state health department by CDC, okay, by CDC. That quarantine station belongs to CDC. So CDC provides that to the state and the state provides it to us, you know. And we have, a, uh, since um, uh, we, we, we do have a very robust 
communicable disease reporting and surveillance system, we called it. That is CDC compliant, state health department compliant, electronic web-based robust surveillance system we have in place. So that information is passed onto that system, and then we quickly see it, and we do the monitoring as required based on the criteria. Yes. About the person who showed up yeah. yesterday. Uh, with, uh, this is Director Shape, uh, Director of Public Safety. Yeah. Hey, listen, everybody knows that this is not uncommon, incidents like that. We anticipated something like that happening. That's why we set up a hotline for people to call us to get information. But unfortunately, we're dealing with something new. Uh, the CDC is trying to learn about it so they can give us more information. People get scared and panic. So this person yesterday was scared and was afraid that they may have been uh, exposed, so they put a mask and gloves on and came looking for help. And again, we anticipated that. Our officer at the door knew what to do, never got into City Hall. We obtained him help. That could still happen to us tomorrow if someone gets scared and stops thinking reasonably. But we would like to get out to everybody, please, we have set up this hotline to call so we can help you. So anyone who thinks they might be exhibiting symptoms, don't hesitate, call us. We'll have somebody, a medical person will reach out to you and we will take care of you from that point on. But again, we could, we could have more people who don't follow those directions and we're ready for them. So this person did not necessarily contaminate you? No. 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 Not even the officer? No. no. And were they tested? They, they were taken for medical attention, yes. I mean, they're worried, so they're going to go get a test, yes. Okay. It's, still, it's still in progress, but they came in with, with a, a face yeah. mask on saying that he has coronavirus, and then we had to take procedures from there. But yeah, and I mean, this is to, like a daily to, unfortunate sort of concern that we have. Yeah, and to be fair, this is just a person who, again, was fearful and came seeking help. I'm not trying to in any way say anything negative about them. I'm glad they sought help. But we have a better way for people to seek help, and we, which pe we would rather people do that. No. Uh, before you start, uh, somebody did ask for my uh, hotline number, and that is very important. So if you could, anyone in Jersey City, 201-547-5208. It's manned 24 hours. You'll have a very short conversation with the call taker, and then we will have medical personnel get back to you. Yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> yeah. We're, we're, working, we're working through the, the details of the time and the mechanism for the liquor license in order to enact it um, this morning. And um, we're, we're committed to doing it and recognizing that everything that we read, even though it changes daily, everybody talks about social gathering and controlling that. And so we want to put restrictions in place wherever we can. And uh, we'll take it basically week by week is how we're approaching this. So you'll have more information on that in a, in 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 a short order. What about tracking people there? What about tracking people who come into yeah. just a, a regular restaurant? As yeah, so to look, we're trying our best to, to find the balance of, of, uh, of you know, being reasonable, of, uh, <laughs> of protecting people and not infringing on people's personal rights, right? And so, you know, what we are recommending large venues is to take attendance in the case that Stacey or Dr. Batola needs to follow up and find out who they interacted with. So we're taking a process around that. Um, where there's opportunities to control places that have large gatherings, like some of the nightclubs, some of like the larger venues, it makes sense in order to take that step. As I said earlier, every single uh, school is having this conversation, every single work environment is having this conversation, and they know who's coming in and out, and they're taking precautions, telling people to work from home or don't come into the work environment. So common sense would say if you have an uncontrolled environment, you have thousands of people coming in and out um, nightly, potentially, why would we not put restrictions around that until we have more clarity from the state and federal government on what we're going to be doing? How about houses of worship? I mean, we are going to be educating housing of worship regarding taking attendance as well in the case that uh, Stacy and Dr. Patel and Health and Human Services need to follow up with people. Our expectation, even though we keep saying that we do not have any uh, uh, known cases here in Jersey City. Our expectation is that we will have known cases here in Jersey City. So we are acting as if we do have cases and that we want to track people. And so we want to make sure that we have the ability to say that this person who uh, tested positive, we know where they went, who they likely interacted with, so we could get ahead of it. And that's what we're trying to do today. The reason the city's being so aggressive, probably more aggressive than anybody in the state of New Jersey, is because we want to be proactive, knowing we have a large population, and it's a complicated population. We have a very, very diverse community, the most diverse in the entire 
entire country. We have an underinsured population as well. We have language barriers. There are a lot of issues here that we have to deal with that are complicated, different than other municipalities. The school system here, we have a high poverty rate, and we have to deal with that. So we think through all of these different issues a little bit more in detail than other communities. Uh, in this city, uh, everyone that is living here is treated equal through the eyes of the health department, whether you have full documentation or you're undocumented. If you are experiencing these symptoms, we will work with you. We have staff that speak um, approximately 12 different languages, and if we need an interpreter, we have access to interpreter lines to work through that. I think currently our, our staff that's directly on the phone speak about five different languages, uh, and then if we need any additional support, um, we're doing that. We obviously run a division of immigrant affairs. We are letting anyone know when they come in for an appointment, um, what we're up to, giving them additional information. And, you know, we also wanted to make sure that our senior population is really um, protected. So we have our Meals on Wheels. We have congregate meal sites. Um, our Meals on Wheels, we started yesterday with delivering um, meals ready to eat in case anyone um, of our seniors needs to be quarantined. Those are our, our most at-risk population. In addition, at our congregate meal sites, we're holding off additional activities, but we're still providing meals until there's a time where we don't. We're using our SWIFT 911, reverse 911 system, so that we can inform everyone in our programming what's going on, kind of check in with them every morning, reminding them if they're sick not to, to come to one of our events. And uh, we're, those are very small, like inside a building itself. So it's uh, just very um, coordinated. Yeah, listen, uh, we deal with that in the police department all the time. Uh, we, you've heard me say before, people can come to us, no problem. We have no issue with that. Our communities know that if they need help from Jersey City, they reach out to us and they get it. Again, this is just a different version of what the police department deals with all the time. Are there any travel restrictions being contemplated? No. Mayor, can you Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, so as of uh, Monday morning, no city staff is traveling outside the state and or there's been restrictions on conferences and other meetings that are just not uh, extremely necessary or emergent to the immediate health needs. Yep. Don't have enough. So are you aware of any yeah. steps being taken? I remember after Sandy, I think. Do you want to handle that, Craig? Well, you want to start with the so, medical so I, that was part of our conversation this morning uh, with the medical center and OEM. Um, I guess I'll have the medical center speak first, and then I'll have emergency management speak to the conversation around equipment that we ordered additional, when we think that's going to be delivered, what has been conveyed to us on that front. Thank you. Good morning. Mike Loftus, Chief Medical Officer, Jersey City Medical Center. Um, there are constrained supplies for certain protective equipment. Uh, the health system is taking a very proactive approach on making sure that those are uh, regulated and used appropriately so that they're not being overused and that supply dwindles. Uh, as of now, we have all the equipment we need to provide a safe working environment and to adequately protect staff from any patients who may be uh, exhibiting signs of infection. So I, I will say, uh, uh, Michael Perlitsky, President and CEO of Jersey City Medical Center. So Medical Center uh, has been around for a long time and responded to a number of different public emergencies over that time frame. We have ability, we have uh, uh, capacity to scale up, scale down as necessary to serve this community. We're also backed by a very large health system uh, that has the resources, again, to respond as necessary. Uh, we have no concerns, again, uh, in uh, meeting the demand as it uh, ramps up. As the mayor said, we do expect cases. Uh, they'll show up, and we expect that we'll handle them no problems. Our staff is extremely well trained. Uh, our nurses, our physicians, our techs, our support staff, they're all uh, great professionals and uh, deal with this really on a daily basis. It's just a matter of scale. Thank you. And uh, I'll have Greg Kears, who is our director of OEM, uh, speak to the city supplies. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, this past Monday, we had a briefing for our police and firefighters by uh, Stacy and uh, Dr. Bastola. Uh, obviously, since then, we've issued out uh, packets containing masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer to our police officers. We've also installed uh, Perel machines in the, the districts. As the doctor had mentioned before, one of the big issues here is supply and demand. Unfortunately, everybody's in the same boat when it comes to getting the equipment. We have a standing order in with a vendor who we deal with quite regularly, uh, and we're being told that once the shipments are available, we're a priority and we will be receiving more. Okay. And then, yeah. We have to assume so. Yeah. So, so, okay. <laughs> they say yes. Yes. Well, do you want to see? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's like a. Okay. Yeah. I mean, listen. What, we just assume so. I mean, there's hundred, there's over 100 cases in New York City, and people go back and forth from New York City to Jersey City all the time. So uh, the answer to your question, we we assume that somebody with contag with this contagion must have passed through at one point or another. It would be illogical to assume anything else. That's why we're taking, as the mayor said, whatever reasonable steps we can, which is what the CDC is asking, take reasonable whatever reasonable steps you can to slow potential contagion. Okay. And that, that's it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have top, um, it's around uh, 40 to 50, I should say, and some have been cleared already, and we do uh, keep on getting some of the numbers, so I am sorry, I don't have exact number, my epidemiologist would know that. Uh, but we do have some, and uh, around 50 we have been monitoring, you know, I would say. Let me just say that the, the, the likelihood of that is, is that the vast majority of those are not test positive. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that's to, to no, be clear on positive. that. They are not healthy individuals. Yes, They are healthy yes. exposed. They are not positive at all. Okay, and, and uh, so I want to say thank you for coming and thank you for the team. Um, you know, I, I just hope that the public recognizes the fact that, you know, Jersey City is being as aggressive as possible. We're being proactive. Um, and as I said earlier, we, we, we do believe that this is important with all of the uncertainty surrounding this. And uh, Jersey City is trying to be as proactive as possible in making sure that we protect all of our residents. And we're taking every necessary precaution on every front. And... Um, and uh, if there's any additional questions, please reach out to Kim later today. So thank you all. Appreciate it.